and grab Thomas, and then we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Catherine Shortle, Educational Accessibility Specialist with Student Life. I just don't want to. Sorry. That's okay. No, I'm just going to introduce the, the, give you the title, uh, follow the duties. I was given a very uh, nice pathway of the things to do, and I don't want to waste any time. But I also know that we have people on the, in other places in their offices and across the province that might be wanting to hear uh, the presentation as well. So my name is Jennifer Brown. I'm in Student Life and had the opportunity to volunteer with the planning for the conference. So delighted to be here to introduce our first session. I hope you enjoyed the keynote. I thought it was fantastic. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Catherine Shortle uh, from the Blunden Center. And the presentation is our role in strengthening the student educational experience, universal design in the university classroom. And I'm going to hand it off to Catherine right away. And uh, then the others can introduce themselves. Thank you. So what I was hoping we would do today is have an further the conversation around what are we doing in our classrooms or wherever we're delivering services across the campus. I have never been accused of being a numbers person or starting any presentation I've ever done with numbers. However, I have taken a departure today. Oh, and I've already misstepped. So we are trying to uh, model alternate formats and giving people options in terms of how you engage with audiences. We are going to try a live closed caption while we are presenting for those people who respond better to text. We have this little thing that has a really fancy technical term, that little square boxy thing that you can download onto your phone and have your presentation on your tablet close to you if that is something that uh, resonates with you. I don't know how long this takes. Not long. Done if you're doing it. Uh, we are going to talk about the student demographics. I want to contextualize why I feel that we cannot do our services any more without talking about the varied learner. And I think it's helpful if we look at who is in our classrooms and who's coming to our classrooms in order to ignite sort of motivation and shared responsibility to our approach to teaching and learning. We don't at Blunden ever present when we don't invite one of our students to join us and to share their experience because that is how we are the experts in our field. We listen to people with lived experience who are telling us what is working for them, why it's working, and how we can continue to prove. I want us I know you're doing things in your own service units or your classrooms, and I want us just to have a moment to talk about those things. We will gather them up if you will share them with us, and we want to continue to promote the things that we are already doing and build on it. Kathy from the Blunden Center, who will introduce herself when she starts, will talk to us about universal instruction and design and the kinds of ways that we can change the way we interact with our students. And it wouldn't be a fulsome uh, conversation if we didn't have an instructor perspective. And we'll have Jason Geary join us not only as a teacher uh, consultant with CITL, but also as an instructor and his perspective about what he has done in the classroom. I never start anything with numbers, but here we are. I'm a social worker by trade. Numbers wasn't really important. I'm a facilitator. But I don't think we can have this conversation without looking at the students who are here at Memorial. So this is a quick snapshot. My stats are coming from the fact book with the university stats, further stats from the Department of Education, as well as Stats Canada. But this is our enrollment over the last uh, period from 65 to 2018. And we can see that we peaked a little over 18,000. Uh, back in the 1990s, and we dipped a little and we're sort of holding our own uh, as we're moving along the continuum. And I thought it was important for us to look at it from a profile of students who may identify with disability. I often don't speak like this either because I come very strongly grounded in a social model of disability where it, I spend energy understanding what the environment is doing in terms of enhancing our participation no matter who we are. 
but sometimes it's important for us to look at how people identify. And so I use this to show you that the students that are showing up on our campuses, that are in our classrooms, are identifying in ways that are changing over time. So this is a profile that is looking at people who would identify with a learning disability or in mental health, low vision or blind, hard of hearing or deaf, attention deficit disorders, chronic illnesses, or mobility, physical, and other just happens to be the way that several uh, new kinds of ways people identified were collected later in our uh, profiles. And in that category, people who identify on the autism spectrum are gathered there. So if you look really quickly from 2008 to 2018, we are seeing our general enrollment is, it went up a little bit, we're in the 18 uh, thousands, and you can see we're having growth in terms of identity in places such as mental health. We see a great increase in ADHD, and generally we are seeing the population of students who are identifying with disability growing. We've heard lots of experiences that tell us that it's not that students who have an identified disability are now joining us as much as it is people are identifying with disability who are here. I think it's really important for us then to understand, well, where are our students coming from? Because what I'm getting to is this idea that there's something nefarious happening here on the campus that all these people are showing up with all these disabilities and suddenly every class we have to add on accommodations. When in fact if we look to where our students are coming from, we see in 2018 our full-time undergraduate and graduate, the majority of our students are coming homegrown from Newfoundland and Labrador, as well as our part-time graduate and undergraduates. Why I want us to look at this is because if they're coming from Newfoundland and Labrador, then they're coming from our K-12 system. I wanted to look at the demographics in terms of our population. We have 65,401 students currently enrolled in our K-12 system. As you can see, about 20 in each category. This is a profile in 2016-2017 of the kinds of identities that students have in our K-12 system. We have 8,901 students currently in our K-12 system who identify with a specific learning disability. The percentage of students in our classrooms, those who we serve in student affairs, are coming from Newfoundland and Labrador. We will continue to see more and more students join us on this campus who identify with disability. Some of the categories were slightly different in um, the Department of Education versus how we gathered our stats, but I wanted to do a quick comparison in 2016 of our categories versus those coming from the K-12 system and you see that we have very similar identified populations or cohorts that are coming to our campus. So why I share all that is because that is who our student is. This is not an anomaly. We are not specializing in giving out accommodations because some students need it. The student population that is here on campus and who's coming to campus will show up with a need to learn in a way that's a little different than what we may have been doing in the past or feel as a standard student in our class. I would really like to introduce Jamie Lake. Jamie is a student here at Memorial. And Jamie, I'll invite you up and Kathy to join us to have a little chit chat. I just want to ask Jamie to share with you her experiences, what high school was like and how she transitioned here into Memorial, what it was like, how she found her way to Blunden, 
and then what she's currently experiencing in her own faculty. And so Jamie, I would just like to say thank you for sharing your story with us. Hi. Your microphones work by just switching them on. There you go. Good morning. Uh, I am, my name is Jamie Leake. I uh, just finished my third year of university uh, doing a kinesiology degree. So yeah. Um, I'm here to talk about my uh, two neurological uh, developmental disorders. I have ADHD and narcolepsy. Um, Jamie, let me introduce, let me in interrupt. <laughs> okay. Tell us about your high school experience. So in high school, I was, uh, wasn't aware of my uh, disabilities, um, not until my second year of university actually, but in high school uh, I had straight A's actually ever since I was uh, in school from K to 12 um, and it, it, was, it was easy for me. School, school was not a problem, I'm, honestly I'm, I'm smart um, and I'm intelligent um, and when, however, when uh, when it was time for midterms or exams, anything. Um, I always notice now looking back at it, especially now that I'm aware of it, but I always, uh, I always stayed longer to finish my exams, but that was, that was just normal to me. I thought, uh, well, I, I just, I need longer to finish it, I'm just, I'm just slow. But never once did it occur to me that I have ADHD because I know people, some like my cousins have ADHD, but the cousins who have it, which follows the stigma, um, he is, he's, he's a male, and uh, he is not necessarily what you would call intelligent. So unfortunately, when I look back at it now, um, I wish that somebody had picked up on the fact that I was staying after um, to finish my exams. Um, I shouldn't have been able to, but I was always the last person to finish, and if I did need extra time, my teachers would allow me the extra time because they knew I was a good, they know I was a good student, and they just didn't assume anything. They're like, well, she's a good student, so I guess she can stay and finish her exam. Anything, like final exams, I was able to stay. I was the only person in that gym by myself, but it still wasn't, I don't know, suspected that I have a learning disability, which I find weird. So then fast forward, mm -hmm. you come to Memorial in the following September, and then what happens? Uh, so September comes, uh, university, and I was already you know, nervous for that, so I knew that it was gonna be an extra workload, um, but I was fine. I just increased my study habits. Um, but when my first exam came, or at least uh, we'll say, exams, first session of midterms, um, I didn't have those teachers to let me have that extra time. So at least one or two pages were always left out uh, for me to finish. So, and that was just like, it was uh, so surprising to me because I was like, well, I don't, I don't get this extra time to finish my exams because these profs are obviously not going to let me finish. There's another class that has to come in. So my first term comes, uh, finishes, and I get my grades back with a 2.3 GPA. Uh, like I said, I had straight A's. I graduated with a 94 uh, average. Um, and then at the end of my year, for the first year in the winter, at the win winter semester, I had a 1.7 GPA. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> especially because I have a twin, identical twin sister, um, been, I identical with our marks, virtually the same, um, through all throughout uh, our academic career. Um, so when she finished with a 3.8 GPA, you could, uh, you could assume what my parents were thinking, and myself. It's like, you aren't studying enough. And I'm like, well, maybe, you're, maybe I'm not studying enough. Like, you, you obviously aren't, but like, nothing changed. So that obviously was disappointing. So uh, that, that was that. <laughs> um, and also to touch on just a bit of the narcolepsy side because I always, like, it was obvious that I couldn't finish my test. But then you have this other disorder that adds on to it. So my final exam for, I was taking physics, and I remember this 
exam very well because I was two hours into my exam and I was still on the first page. <laughs> I was falling asleep um, uncontrollably and I couldn't, it's with narcolepsy, it's, it's different. It's, you're like going in and out of consciousness. And I couldn't, for the life of me, try to even write down stuff. And if I did, I'd just scribble off the page. So <laughs> never mind not being able to finish. I couldn't even pay attention to write my exam. So I figured out that summer, I was diagnosed by my uh, family doctor that I have narcolepsy. So then my second year in university comes, and I still don't have um, supports uh, via the Blumen Center because I just didn't, I didn't, first I didn't know that I could get support for narcolepsy was one thing. And uh, I didn't know I had ADHD. So my midterms roll around again, and I still couldn't finish. I thought it was fine now that I knew that I had narcolepsy and I was medicated for it, but uh, I w that wasn't the case because I still could not, like I was still awake, that's fine to finish my midterms, <laughs> but I could not, I could not finish them. Um, so I, I uh, talked to my dad, who is a GP, and he's not my GP, but he's a hey GP, and uh, <laughs> he told me that, uh, I told him I can't finish my exams. I know everything on it if I know how to answer it. So, but I, I just, I just can't finish them because I don't have the time. The test is take away from me before I'm able to finish it. So he says, uh, you might have ADHD. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Because like I was, I followed the stereotype, um, unfortunately, that I am a woman and I am intelligent so I don't have ADHD, which is not the case. Um, so he said, yeah, so we, I got a, an appointment with Dr. Dix up at the, uh, the center above the Blumen Center. Yeah, the Counseling Wellness Center. Yeah, the yeah, Counseling yeah. Wellness Center. And after a couple months, um, it was concluded that I have ADHD. So that was actually amazing to me because if I was, it's, it's weird to say, but when I found out that I have ADHD, I was... I was happy, <laughs> it was weird, but I was so happy and thrilled because it meant that all of my performances for that past year um, had an explanation. It meant that no, it's not that I miraculously became unintelligent, it's that I, the course, was, course load was increased and there were no teachers to give me extra time. Um, so I yep, so I'm going to move you along. You yep. come to the Blunden Center. Yep. You get so yeah. set up with accommodations. Right, and which was amazing. Um, first of all, though, coming into the room, I didn't expect to see some of my friends that were there. Um, it's it's amazing because you think about this center that accommodates people for learning disabilities, or at least again the stereotypical, and you don't think that it's just you know, your friends and people like you, right? So that was comforting to see. Um, but yeah, so back to grades. At the, after my first term of accommodations, I finished um, my year with a 3.8 GPA. Then the second term comes around and I have a 4.0. And then the other term comes around and I have a 4.0. <laughs> so that was really, really great to see. Um, so Jamie, yeah. when you shared the story with me, you started yeah. um, finding the support at London, mm -hmm. setting up accommodations that were working for you. Right. But you shared a lot about what you did then in terms of figuring it out yourself. Yeah. And in, if that'll lead you into mm -hmm. what's happening in HKR. Yeah, so that was difficult at the beginning. And even like once I became aware that I had a learning disability or um, to disorders for that matter, um, I noticed things that made me realize, okay, this is happening for this reason, and now I can fix it. So what happened before, I knew that I had narcolepsy and ADHD was specifically narcolepsy right now, but um, I would wake up, go to class, which was an hour after I woken up, and within 10 to 20 minutes, I'd fall asleep. So. That was, again, wonderful because I couldn't uh, concentrate. But now that I had I would, had been medicated and now that I know what was wrong, I'm able to uh, correct those things. So 
um, before I thought I would listen to my profs, um, but I wouldn't under I wouldn't be able to retain any information. But now I understand why. It's be I, it's because I'm just not pro my brain just can't comprehend it because it's working too fast. So that's what I first tried to do. I tried to okay, well I'm just going to sit in class and I'm going to listen to my prof speak. Um, but whether I was able to control that or not, I could not listen to them after probably five minutes because I just wander into whatever my mind wanted to. What's for supper? Who knows? Um, so <laughs> then I thought, okay, uh, I will start writing down everything that my prof is saying so I can follow along. Um, that didn't work either because I was focusing so hard on trying to write down what my prof was saying, my professors were saying, that I didn't actually, I wasn't listening or actually thinking about what I was writing down. So after a couple of weeks of trying to figure that out, I said, okay, I'll print the notes, PowerPoint, which is amazing that everybody prints PowerPoint, I mean, does PowerPoints now because it gives me the ability to print the PowerPoint um, and then I can just highlight it without having to write it down. So I will highlight, but at the same time, read it. So, and then I realized when I did that, I actually, and it's surprising, and I, I don't need to listen to the prof. And it's not that I don't need to, it's I can't. I can't listen to my professor speak because I don't get anything out of it. Um, sometimes I actually don't go to class um, because I stay home in my room to look over my notes because then there isn't a voice talking which isn't interrupting me trying to read and follow my notes. Um, then I thought about it and uh, my profs probably think that she's not coming to class because she doesn't want to learn. But it's actually the opposite. I'm not going to class because I want to learn. Uh, and it is a weird scenario, but that is the case. Um, and I was talking to Catherine the other day, and she said, what do you think your profs think about that? And I said, well, that's exactly it. They probably think, in definitely not the very highly of me when I am not in, cl in their class. You know, it's, it does look disrespectful, and I can see that, that, you know, they're here to teach you, but I'm not there for them to teach me. Um, and that's hard to realize, but at the end of the day, I'm in school to learn and to get an education. And if my, the best way that I can do that is being in my room in quiet and doing it, I think that should be respected. Um, and you know, it's not, it's, it's not the professor's fault, professors, plural, for thinking that you know, that's dis disrespectful, but maybe if they were um, aware of people such as myself and the different ways that we learn, um, they might understand, they might understand uh, my view of it. Have you had a conversation with any of your instructors about how you learn best? Uh, actually, well, not really because I don't like saying to, I said it to one professor once and they didn't, they were, they were fine as it said, whatever helps you. But I don't feel comfortable bringing it up to people bec that many professors because I don't know how they'll take it if I say I'm not coming to your class because of this. And it's just not that I, it's more so that the conversation hasn't come up. Um, nobody has confronted me, but I sit in the front of the class and when I think about it, I'm at home in my room, I said, uh, they're gonna notice I'm not there because I talk to all my professors, especially in my faculty, um, I love, uh, communicating with them uh, and it's it's you know it's very tight-knit you're in a faculty that you share interest with and you're gonna want to talk to your professor so they're gonna know when you're not there so it's interesting if any of you took in the keynote this morning is that dialogue and teaching happens all over the place right so you reaching out to have conversations with your instructors that don't happen to yeah. be someone at the front and you in your seat right is you yeah. actively learning and they actively engaging exactly. and teaching you. Yeah, right? and it is, um, speaking of my faculty, it is, uh, they are very supportive. Um, they constantly will say that if you need accommodations, we can set up, um, we can set that scenario up in the faculty with just right there, um, which is great. You know, I, I know I've been in many other, um, 
I, I've heard at least of many other faculties and my friends, and that's not necessarily offered. Um, so that's great. You know, they'll set up a room. Um, they'll set up a room in the in the building as for all the people who need accommodations for that class, so that it's uh, if we do have questions, the instructor is close by. Um, however, my first experience with this wasn't uh, wasn't ideal because. Um, just recently, well, the past semester, uh, I decided to give it a go for accommodations because I, I was comfortable with the Blunden Center, but you know, if I would like, I just wanted to see what it was like. Um, my accommodations were put up next to the squash courts, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> that was again <laughs> a fun experience. Um, so I was just up there with the bang, 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 monotonous sound, and. I couldn't concentrate, um, didn't affect my performance, however, but that I still, it's not an ideal situation. So I went to my prof after and I said, uh, I understand you wanted to accommodate people, but just to let you know, um, I go to the Blunden Center so I can have a, uh, a space where I can, you know, it's, it's distraction not reduced. Yes, distraction reduced environment. And uh, I said, Having a being next to a squash court with uh, people playing is not necessarily my uh, view of a distraction reduced environment. So okay, okay, we'll fix that next time. So the next, sorry. And I think that is certainly shows us where we're moving uh, across the campus in terms of understanding our roles and trying to support our students in our faculties and at the classroom level. But from a systems point of view and from an infrastructure point of view, we've got to be able to support the faculties to, to do just that. Right, and it wasn't, it wasn't their fault. It's not because they, it's, it's not their fault for not knowing. I mean, you're not going to know about a situation until you are exposed to it. I didn't know about what I needed until I, I found out that I did. So you can't, you can't blame a person for not understanding what they what they they don't go through you know so um, they it's it they just need to be told it's not that they're they're they should be shamed for not knowing they just need to be aware of it it's as simple as that yeah thank you Jamie for thank sharing you. and I think that is a really nice place to end because I think it is all of our mm -hmm. responsibility the student has a sense of responsibility to be able to eke out and have dialogue with the needs and how to have them met the support units that are there are there to help to support the faculties and the other administrations that need um, any kind of support to actual actualize the accommodations within their own. Um, thank, you. thank you. And <laughs> if anyone have questions, we can hold them off till the, the end. We're just going to transition into Kathy is going to share some ideas around given that Jamie is uh, a student here and this is how Jamie learns and her interactions with teaching. What kinds of things out there can help us fine tune that process in our classroom uh, and share the responsibility in making the education accessible. So thanks again, Jamie. Thank you. And Kathy. Yep. There you go. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about universal design. And universal design is my slide up here. Where's the clicker? I don't even know how to use it. I was coming. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Just this one. That one there? Perfect. Okay. This one here, slide. No. There you go. Tricky. All right, so universal design. So I think everybody is probably familiar with universal design and, and the principles of it. So it's about equitable use, the flexibility in use, and it's simple, and there's a low physical effort. And some, some examples of universal design are things like curb cuts and sliding doors and ramps. And even in, in, in today, like technology, so texting would be a universal design option closed captioning, which we're doing here, assistive technologies like Kurzweil, which a lot of our students use, text-to-voice, Dragon, which is great for everybody. Um, hang on, I click again. And so there's also universal design for learning, and I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to leave that to Jason, who's an expert in that. And so that's based on principles 
of, of, of universal design. So universal design for learning is based on principles of universal design, and universal design for learning promotes de the development of curriculum that includes multiple means of engagement. So Jamie was talking about, you know, you go to class, or maybe you learn at home, or you, you know, you use a video, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. So what I'm going to talk a little bit more about is actually universal design of instruction. So that sort of matches up universal design and the principles of universal design for learning and applies them to all aspects of instruction. So the curriculum, but also the physical environment and, and things like that. So, and it makes things, it's, I guess it's, you know, with the goal towards a greater accessibility for all students, not just students with disabilities, but anybody that's showing up. So some examples of universal design practices include the class climate, interaction, physical environments and products, delivery methods, information resources and technology, feedback, assessment, and accommodation. All right, so let's, I'm going to go through all of these quickly and just give you a little example. I'm okay, and there's lots of resources out there on this stuff. And if you want some information on it, you can, you can look it up yourself, or you can certainly call me, and I can direct you to some resources. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about class climate. So really, that's kind of, um, you want to adopt practices that reflect high values with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. So it's how, you know, how you welcome your students, what your class is like, the atmosphere in your class when students come in. So it might be that you would put a statement on your syllabus and inviting students maybe to meet with you uh, to discuss any disability-related accommodations or supports. Uh, it might also be that you avoid stigmatizing any students, so don't draw attention to any differences or share private information about a student who has a need for an accommodation in front of their classmates. Interaction with students. So encourage regular and effective interactions between students and the instructor and also between students as well. And um, the, the speaker right. talked about that this morning actually. So students interacting with each other because peer to peer, you know, students can uh, learn a lot from that. Um, and ensure that communication methods are accessible to all participants. Uh, so when you assign group work for which learners must support each other, and that places a high value on different skills and roles. So not everybody is comfortable with presentations. Uh, so maybe they might be better with doing up the presentation instead of actually presenting. <laughs> Number three is the physical environments and products. So ensure that facilities, activities, materials, and equipment are physically accessible to and usable by all students, and that all potential student characteristics are addressed in safety considerations. So I guess arrange instructional space to maximize comfort and inclusion, allow room for, for things like wheelchairs and assistive technologies in classrooms. Uh, I have noted up here, develop safety procedures. So I'm not saying that instructors need to develop procedures, but you should know if you're teaching in a classroom where the fire exits are, in particular if you have a student maybe who's in a chair, so you can direct that person and know who you need to contact to ensure that student's safety. So that's just one little thing there. We'll move right along and we'll talk about delivery methods. So use multiple accessible instructional methods that are accessible to all learners. So multiple modes to deliver content. So textbooks, YouTube video, YouTube, or videos in your classroom. So mix things up a little bit where you can. Uh, also provide some cognitive support. So write key points on the board for students. Provide scaffolding tools like outlines, class notes, summaries, both print and online. And if possible, if students request to give it ahead of time so that they're prepared when they come to class, they're not just getting it at the class, or some instructors give it after they've taught the class, uh, which a lot of students that I meet with, they would prefer to have it before so that they're ready when they go to class. Information resources and technology. Encourage your students to apply accessibility standards in their presentations. So ensure that course materials and notes and other information resources are engaging, flexible, and accessible for all students. So you present and make sure you're following accessibility standards, but also encourage your students to do that as well in, their, in the classroom so that they're providing information that is accessible to all their, all their fellow classmates. Um, Let's see, what else we have here? Number six is feedback. 
So provide specific feedback on a regular basis. Uh, allow students to turn in parts of a large project for feedback before the final project is due. Uh, provide sample questions if you can and answer keys to those questions and study guides. So additional resources for your students. Uh, two, more, two more left, so assessment. So regularly assess student progress using multiple accessible methods and tools and adjust instruction accordingly. So assess group and cooperative performance, as well as individual achievement. And the guest speaker, the keynote speaker today talked about that, working with groups and, and, and assessing how group, um, group projects work and things like that. And I know a lot of students that I meet with talk about working in groups, and it's difficult for them sometimes. They feel they don't fit in or they're not making the contribution in a way that it works best for them. So that's where I think instructors kind of helping to manage groups a little bit could be very helpful. Uh, and the final practice here for UDI would be accommodation. So plan for accommodations for students whose needs are not met by instructional design. So know how to arrange for accommodations. So be aware of the resources that are on campus that are available for, for students. So like the Blunden Center, or the Counseling and Wellness Center, academic advising. We have a fantastic writing center. Uh, some really good people working over there that are always willing to help students. And share that information with your student. Tell them what's available. Oftentimes students have no idea of these resources. Or if you have a student that is struggling or you feel is struggling, speak with them, refer them to the resources, see how you can help them. Again, like I said, a lot of students are just not aware of the resources that are available for them. And <clears throat> I am very happy now to pass this over to Jason, uh, Gary, and Jason's gonna talk about his experiences with universal design in learning. Can you hear me now? Okay, so just a time check, Jennifer. <coughs> okay. Oh. Uh, if anyone has to leave, we'll probably go a couple of minutes over, especially if, there's, if anyone wants to ask a question or we can stay behind to ask a question. So if you need to leave to get ready for another presentation, feel free to do that when we hit 11.45. So I'm going to try not to go over. Um, don't laugh. Um, but no, I, I, uh, so one of the things that I was asked uh, to, to talk about and to, to highlight um, is, well, two things. One, uh, this isn't about disability, right? This is about access for everybody. Um, particularly when you know the research that 60% of students with disabilities don't self-identify. So we have more students, many more students in our classrooms with disabilities with variability uh, than we do that, that seek the, the help of the Blown-In Center. So, so that's really my research and, and my look at universal design for learning, really tried to look at that and say this isn't about accommodations, because accom we're not, accommodations aren't going away, right? But this is, these are things that we can do in our classrooms that, that try to tap in to acknowledge that variability in, in our learners. So I just wanted to highlight my experience, um, and, and some of them are very ugly in trying to do this and, and trying to experiment. Um, but I, I wanted to highlight one course that I, I really chose to put a concerted effort into um, for a number of reasons. And it was Education 4240, it's an introduction to exceptional learners. So this is for undergraduate students, BED, uh, bachelor's in education, who uh, will be introduced probably for the first time to the concept of students with disabilities. So they'll learn about every disability in this course. It's a required course, so there's many sections. Um, universal design for learning is actually uh, part of the content, part of the curriculum in, in this particular course that we lectured on and lectured on and lectured on, which, which I'll talk about. Um, multiple course sections, multiple instructors. Since this is a required course every semester, um, there are a number of us that, uh, that are required to teach it. There's a predetermined textbook. So because there are multiple instructors, multiple course sections, we have to use a predetermined textbook. Um, and because, again, there are multiple course sections, we have limited ability to change the assessment scheme uh, or the evaluation scheme. And so there are limitations that come with that. Uh, and I want to highlight that because when, when I do sessions for instructors around UDL, they often throw up things like we can't change the textbook or I can't eliminate the textbook, I can't change the fact that there's tests. So I, I thought um, being able to share my experience with that might be, uh, might be helpful. 
So I, I kind of did this in uh, two columns. So I have the pre-UDL offering, so that's where my first semester teaching, I got a couple of weeks notice that I was going to teach this course, which is generally how it goes. Um, and so I'll share my first offering. This is very, these are the warts of my teaching. This is very hard for me to acknowledge. <laughs> um, but, but I think that's important because it, it does uh, give us a hope that we can become better. Uh, so a textbook only. So it's this predetermined textbook I had to use. That was it. Um, so no supplemental resources, just straight textbook. So we assume already that students are going to be able to digest or they care about reading this material. 50 minute lectures only, and I lectured for 50 minutes, maybe 52 minutes. Um, PowerPoint karaoke, right? Click, 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 pay attention. Um, I had no idea what an LMS was or what Brightspace, what D2L was. I had no idea when I started to teach what that was. So nothing went in there. Is the captioning keeping up with me? <laughs> I talk fast. Uh, so I also assumed, um, wrongfully, that I was the expert. I'd been a teacher for 15 years. I had you know, these degrees. I was the expert. And everyone came or didn't to listen to me uh, impart knowledge. I was in it. Um, <laughs> my attendance got progressively worse throughout the semester. I thought, I thought that was uh, very interesting. I think in the last week, you know, there were maybe five students. Um, which, looking back on it now, I, I know why. Um, so I had a, a group project. Again, we, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I just random assignments. So I just randomly assigned students. Uh, and the only option for the group project was PowerPoint, because they're going to be teachers. And we were told they have to do a PowerPoint for a group project. Uh, so that was it. So every group had to produce a, uh, a PowerPoint. So here's what I tried to do, a, a caveat. Um, when we change in our teaching, when we, when we look at the research, the scholarship of teaching and learning, they often say, go small, you know, start small, go slow. So what I did instead was started huge and went really fast. Um, <laughs> and it, in the it created a lot of work, um, and, but, but I, would, I would caution you, um, again, t if, if you want to try something different, pick two or three of these uh, where, I, where I chose uh, all the next two slides, and I know all the time. Okay, so one of the things I was able to do in this, uh, in the, when I offered, when I was chosen uh, to, to teach the course again, I picked the classroom that I wanted to teach in. So ones that had tables, it wasn't a lecture hall, four tables, they were naturally in chairs, so I, that's where I wanted to teach. I piggybacked on a field placement, um, and so Ed's here, so it's interesting. I, I was able to get in contact with some of the field placement folks and said, are these students going to be doing any field placements this semester? And they were. So they were going to be on Friday afternoons. They were going to be in schools. And so I thought, perfect. I'm going to add in a component of my assessment that's going to tell, allow them to reflect on that experience in the classroom that I didn't have uh, in that first offering. I did a group at work skills inventory. And, and Dr. Ruth Dewsbury talked about it this morning, asking those questions up front. Do you like group work? Do you, you're going to do it, but do you like it? Um, <laughs> and so I, I asked just a two-pager. I developed it on my own, just questions that I wanted to know. Like, do you bring technology to the classroom? Because I didn't want a group that had the five people, the only five people that bring laptops. So I asked, I had this questionnaire for them. Uh, I had a textbook plus supp supplemental material uh, that I did put in uh, D2L. I found out what D2L was after that first horrible semester. Um, I had a Twitter account, so I just had a hashtag for my classroom so the students could engage uh, outside of the class. I had a mid-semester feedback, so I just asked simply, what can I continue to do? Stop doing, start doing, that would help you uh, learn better. Uh, I used many lectures, so um, I did the maximum my lecture for was 15 minutes. And then everything else was active learning, being engaged, sharing, then I don't know this, and letting students figure it out during class. And I came with the mindset that we're all going to contribute in the classroom, that I'm not the expert. Um, and I, and I, uh, in reading students' reflections, um, it confirmed that I was not the expert in that room. The lived experience in that room was phenomenal. So just some other things. Uh, again, the slides I posted in, in Brightspace, uh, I created an online discussion group. So I created a community of learning outside the classroom. Uh, so we didn't necessarily privilege students who were extroverts and wanted to talk in class. So I created that uh, online as well. Uh, my attendance maintained throughout uh, that course offering. 
Uh, I added an interactive diabetes education model. I don't know why I added that. I thought it was cool at the time, <laughs> but, they, but they, th they thought it was neat as well, uh, and it was pretty new. I added some peer evaluation, peer assessment components to, the, uh, to my assessment and evaluation scheme. Um, again, connecting the, the online component, the tweets, the discussions that we had online and, and offline. Uh, and then a group project. So I said, 